Welcome to Circuit Analysis. This video is about all the different P-SPICE analysis types. I'm going to go over the four basic analysis types, bias point, DC sweep, transient, and AC, as well as multi-run types, where you're sweeping across a certain parameter or running a Monte Carlo or sensitivity and an EVA. So here we are in capture with the circuit from the last tutorial. I'll put a link in the description if you haven't seen that one. And we want to go to Edit Simulation Profile. And this here is going to show in this analysis and this analysis type dropdown the four main types. So we have the time, DC sweep, AC, and bias point. Now bias point is the simplest one. That one is just solving the circuit steady state uh, DC values. So if we run that, it just comes up here in the PSPICE program and there's nothing really on the screen. But now if we click here on this voltage or current or power, we can see the DC bias values on the circuit. So that's all that does. And if we go back, we can check out the next type here is DC sweep. And the DC sweep is basically the same thing, except you can run it multiple times. So the nice thing about this is not only do you have a primary sweep where you can give it a variable here, like VN, uh, so you can do a voltage source, current source, or like a global parameter. So here if we say VN sweeps from minus five to five with uh, one volt increments, then I can go down here and just delete this whole capacitor. Run this and get the voltage probe going on the output. And you can see here it's kind of doing the same thing that it was doing with the capacitor charging, but it's just running 10 different DC bias simulations. So it's just every uh, volt, you can see the bottom here is now voltage. And every time you step a volt on here, there's one data point. That's why this is a straight line between these two points here. So that's all that does. But the really nice thing is you can add a secondary sweep here so you can sweep one value and also sweep another value so it's doing simulations first times the second number of simulations and you can also do monte carlo and uh, temperature sweeps and stuff like that so the next type is the transient analysis this one has a run to time a start saving after time and a maximum step size here as the main three parameters and you just normally start with uh, the runtime here, but this one, start saving after, is if you want to do just an analysis on the steady state part. So you can run this one first, and then if you find it reaches steady state at one millisecond, you can do something like run it for 1.1 milliseconds, and then you can uh, start saving while well, you start saving after one millisecond. So you'll end up just getting 0.1 milliseconds in the actual output and you'll have clipped out the transient part and you'll just be looking at the steady state. That helps a lot when you're using the equations to uh, see what the values are. And then this maximum step size, that can help with convergence, but a lot of times the step size uh, is figured out just fine by the solver. What this really is uh, good for is if you're simulation output is kind of jagged and you want to add more points so you can get more resolution and zoom in and get a cleaner waveform so let's just get rid of this and just run for one millisecond you don't have to put the second part on there it's just the multiplier and then we got to get our capacitor back so luckily i saved this other page here because i accidentally saved it if you save it it kills your undo. See, if I do Control z now, it won't bring this back. But I'm going to paste it from the other sheet. And now we can run this again. And here it is. Since we changed the simulation, we have to insert the uh, waveform again. Because it uh, gets rid of it if you change the simulation type. So here it is. Voltage of the output is coming along, and then... It switches from low to high at this point. 
So that's the transient uh, simulation where it's basically what you'd see on an oscilloscope. Now if we want to try the AC sweep, this is going to be like what you'd see on a network analyzer or a frequency response analyzer. So instead of time on the x-axis, we're going to have frequency. And let's just start at like 100 hertz. We're going to end at like 1 megahertz. And we want, I usually do like 50 points per decade. So we can say OK on that. Now besides setting that up, what we need to do an AC analysis is to give it an AC source. So that's under place, pSpice components, and source. We're going to use a voltage source. They have a current source to AC. Uh, but we're going to do a voltage AC source. I'm just going to place it here. And then I'm going to open up this spot here. We'll just put it in series with this. So we keep the same bias point. And then this, this is really good for things like uh, looking at feedback loops and you can make Bode plots with it. In this, uh, let's just check out the frequency as it propagates through this and it'll be filtered by this filter here, this RC filter, and then it'll also be filtered going through this by the response of this amplifier and we can look at it at these two points and see what the frequency response is. But first, to get the bias point right, we want to get rid of this initial condition of minus 5 volts. Here's the initial condition. Right click, delete property. Yes. This here has a value. So you mostly just want to leave this 1 volt. A lot of the times it uh, won't even matter if you're doing a ratio, but it will if you're not doing a ratio. So we're going to run this. Now here, see we have frequency on the bottom. And I want to look at the in, the P, and the out nodes. So I'm going to just press insert V in. Now V in is a flat line at 1. Now that makes sense, right? So now we want to insert V P. Now you can see here, this is definitely a low pass filter, right? So this right here is 0 to 1 volt and it's definitely getting killed as you go a higher frequency. So we're going to also do an insert. Check out the output. And it looks like nothing really even makes it to the output here. So with this, when you're looking at gain, you usually want to do it in dB. So we can double click on this do the y-axis and change it to a log and OK. Now that makes it a lot easier to look at. And you can see now that the output does actually exist. It's just that when we had it in a linear scale, you couldn't see it because it was too small. Now the other thing to do here is you can use the dB function. So if you write dB around it, so that gives an error because it's a log axis. So got to change this axis back to linear and then go in here, dB. You don't have to do that for all of them. So now we're back to pretty much the same thing we had on the other axis, but now it's listed in decibels. So here, what we can do to make it change a little bit is change the capacitance on this guy right here. So it's a pretty big one, one micro. Let's make it like 100 pico, and we'll run it again. So this time, we don't have to uh, set everything up again. But you can see now the VP here is actually just barely dropping off at the end here. So that is not too visible. Let's do a couple more zeros on that. I guess that would be 10 nano. 
So that's a little bit more visible there. You can see it rolling off here, starting at around 10 kilohertz. Anyway, so why is the output so low, you might ask, and that is because this is a pretty bad example. Uh, the output, if we go back and look at our DC bias point, it's railed high. So we're not at all in the linear region of this op amp. And we even got some weird stuff going on here. <laughs> Looked like 44 volts. Sometimes you get extra of these tags. You can just click on them and hit the delete key to get rid of them. But you can see here we've got 5 volts pretty much on the positive, 0 at the negative, so the output's just totally railed high. It's not linear, so you're not getting any real amplification of the signal. It's pretty much not coming through at all, minus 200 dB or whatever. So the next thing is the multi-runs. Kind of showed that already with the uh, DC sweep, but you can also do AC you know, so this is a AC sweep across frequency, but you can also do sweeps on top of this sweep. So we can do a parametric sweep. We can make this C1 value change. A global parameter, I guess, is probably the easiest way. So let's just call this C1. But this is a global parameter. It's not this capacitor. And we'll start it at, let's say, 1 nano and we'll go to a thousand nano in increments of, we can do logarithmic points per decade, do 10. And I don't know if we really need 10, let's do like three. Okay, so I'll apply that. And this is going to do, I guess, nine points because we have three decades and three points per decade. And to make this go and uh, change the value of this now, we need to make a parameter. And to do that, I'm just going to use a text box because I'm lazy. So we'll do at p spice, and we're going to put dot param c1 equals do 10 nano. It doesn't really matter what this value is. We just need a parameter in the simulation so that it will uh, do the sweep, but it's going to overwrite this based on uh, what we put in the simulation settings. So now open up this value and put these uh, brackets here, this squiggly ones, and do C1 inside of there. So that's saying use the variable C1 value for the value of this. So now we can get rid of these uh, bias points and run this simulation. And you see it makes all nine of these come up and you can select different ones if you just want to look at a few or you can hit OK to view all of them. And it plots them all on top of each other so now you can see multiples and these are all the different ones and they're just in order of the first one to the last one as however you set it up in the simulation. We can go here simulation of let's see view measurement results and then if you want to put some kind of a measurement in here, we're going to do the cutoff low pass here, minus 3 dB on the uh, positive input here. And now you can see that gives all the data points here on the bottom for each of the nine simulations. Looks like we actually ended up with 10 simulations. So now let's go back to the simulation profile. And we've checked out the parametric sweep now. The temperature sweep is the same. You can actually, in the parametric sweep, select temperature, and that's the same as doing the temperature sweep. So I don't know why they've got this one at all. I guess just uh, to help remind you that you can do temperature. I don't know. Um, but that, I guess the nice thing about this is you can set a temperature in here, and you can still do a parametric sweep on something else. But the thing is, they've also got two boxes here. And if you put one temperature in here, it's the same as putting a temperature in here. So it's kind of redundant. But this is uh, just like in the code where you put a dot temp or whatever. You just put however many different temperatures you want in here separated by spaces, and it'll do one run for each of those temperatures. 
or you can just do one temperature if you just want to do all of your uh, analyses at that temperature. So then here is the Monte Carlo in the worst case, which is the last thing I want to talk about. These are the legacy spice ones. There's also some versions of these analyses in what's called the advanced analysis package that ORCAD sells as an additional add-on. I think it's over $2,000, but I'm not sure. It might quote everybody at different prices anyway. I don't use that. I'm going to make another video on why I don't use that because the temperature does not work correctly and I use the temperature setting in simulations a lot. So it's a little bit useless and um, I just use this one or I use scripts to do it, which I'll also make future videos about using the tickle scripts to run multiple analyses. So this is the legacy one and it works just fine. You first start with selecting whether you want a Monte Carlo or a worst case sensitivity. So let's do Monte Carlo first. And what a Monte Carlo is, is it's just doing a whole bunch of runs with some randomness on a parameter. So if you say that you want to model what a circuit will do if you're manufacturing it and you have manufacturing tolerances, then you can put random variables in to simulate the randomness of the manufacturing process and then you can get a feel for the distribution of the different operating points and the different output parameters of the circuit over a whole uh, sort of life cycle of the circuit and you can make sure that it's going to be reliable and still work uh, including those kinds of tolerances. So we might do here 100 runs. This is a simple circuit. It can do 100 runs pretty fast. And then you select your distribution. Now you basically do a uniform or a Gaussian and uniform is what I always do because that's a little bit worse case. Technically Gaussian is going to be a little bit easier on your simulation but there's a couple things to think about uh, if you're not really sure what you're doing just use a uniform um, uniform is good if you have resistors that are high tolerance because a lot of times those are picked out of a bunch of parts like they'll test you know a million resistors and then they'll pick out all the ones that are within one percent sell those as one percent pick out all the ones that are within five percent sell those at five percent in that case, you're basically going to end up with a uniform distribution of parts because they were picked out of a bunch of other parts. If you have a manufacturing process where it's nothing's being picked, it's just kind of random, that might be more Gaussian. But if you're not sure, uniform is worst case. And the other thing I'll say about Gaussian you got to be a little careful with is the tails are a little weird. So in uniform, you're just going to have a random value between your tolerance limits. And with a Gaussian, you're going to have a random value that is distributed uniformly between your tolerance limits, but the tails of the Gaussian kind of go off, you know, with a very small probability way out on the sides, and they, they'll actually go past the tolerance limits you give it. So I've run into problems with that in the simulation before. If I do like a thousand runs, I'll get a few runs that are actually outside of the limit. And that can be a problem if you're doing something where it affects current on something. And for example, I think one of the problems I was having was I was ending up every now and then getting a negative current, which didn't make sense in the circuit I was analyzing. And that would cause it to crash and it took me a long time to figure out why. So that's another reason to be careful with Gaussian distributions. So we'll just leave it uniform. The random seed here, this is if you want to be able to run this uh, simulation and have it be random, it'll uh, pick a hundred random runs. But if you use a seed and you use the same seed twice, it'll pick the same hundred random uh, numbers to use or however many parts you have tolerances for. It'll uh, map that exact same analysis again. So that'll help you if you need to check between it can get annoying if you're doing random analyses and then you run into some kind of an error and you want to check if you fixed it and then you run it and it has like a hundred different random numbers then uh, you might not be really sure if you're comparing it to the same thing that you ran the last time so in that case you use a seed so you can get two of the exact same simulations so that's about it you can you can do your own distribution here as well i've never done that 
So the last one is this output variable. And this output variable for Monte Carlo isn't real important. Uh, we'll see where that's important more for this worst case. But for now, we can just put there like V out. So we'll just say the output of the circuit is our output variable. And we'll do OK. And we got to go back in there because I just realized. Oh, OK. So you got to make sure you check the checkbox to activate it too. So we got rid of the sweep. We have this. I've also noticed sometimes if you close this and then you open it back up, it will not have saved correctly. So sometimes I double check it. Uh, this program's kind of buggy sometimes, although I think it gets slightly better with each version, hopefully. So in SPICE, the way you set a tolerance is with a DEV parameter, which you can see here in the PSPICE template. Over here, it says if you have a tolerance property on this symbol, then it's going to add these extra things. One of them here is DEV equals the tolerance. So DEV equals is the keyword in the PSPICE code, but in the capture symbol, it's the tolerance parameter. So that is right here. And we just give that like 10%, for example. And you can give it a percent or you can give it an absolute value. So you can give it like one uh, nano farad, for example. So now that we've got a tolerance on this, oh, another good thing to do is to display the tolerance. Display, name and value. So now we can see the tolerance on the schematic and we change it from here too. And let's do that for this resistor as well. So give it a tolerance. Give this one a 10% tolerance too. And display it. So now that we have two properties with tolerances, and run the Monte Carlo simulation. And see it says here it's running them. Man, that's pretty fast. So it ran 100 of them. You can see them labeled all the way here down through 100. And now we've got 100 points down here and here and also along this. And I'll just show you another tip you can do is if you click right here, it selects all these and you can do control C on your keyboard. And then you can go into Excel and you can click and you can do control V. Here, I'll just do it. So you do control V and now you have all of these numbers here. So I can select here where the numbers actually start. Control C, come back here and then I can right click and do transpose. Now we've got this. And now I guess we can go even further just for kicks. You go equals and you can write left. We want to get the left part of this number and we want to get this one comma and the length is going to be the length of this minus one. So that'll get rid of these multipliers and get that down there. And if you see here, it looks like it's still uh, treating it kind of like text because it's over on the side. See, it's not pushed to the right. So you can put here like value. And uh, that'll convert it to a number that you can then, you know, plot in Excel or whatever you want to do. So now let's go over the last one, which is the worst case and the sensitivity. Now what this one does is uh, it runs a sensitivity and then a worst case. So in our case, we've only got two parameters and it's going to vary these for the sensitivity each individually. It'll keep one nominal and it'll make the other one high and low. It'll make this one nominal and have this one go high and low. And from that, it will determine which direction 
uh, the sensitivity is for our parameter, which is the output. And then um, since this one is important, this output variable is important here because it's calculating the sensitivity and our output is railed high and not doing anything, let's change it to V of this P because that'll be more sensitive. And it'll tell us the sensitivity of this to both of these parts. And then it'll also calculate the worst case from that sensitivity. So the way it does that is if this node is positively sensitive, for example, to this part, but it's negatively sensitive to this part, then to get the worst case, it'll set like this one to its maximum value and this one to its minimum value. So it's all about the sign of the sensitivity. We'll click OK on that and let's run it. So here's our run and the first one is our sensitivity nominal. Okay, so I'm back in here and I want to do save data for each sensitivity run. And we're going to try that. Okay, so now we can see we got a sensitivity nominal and then we got one for the capacitor, one for the resistor, and then one for the worst case. Now we can see those four runs here on the top with the waveforms and also on the bottom with the measurements. So I know that was uh, pretty fast and not real thorough, but that's just a quick introduction about all the different analysis types. We'll go into a lot more detail in future projects. We're actually using the software on uh, circuits to build stuff, but I hope that helps you get started, and I appreciate you watching, and I'll see you next time.